Well, we just had a pit lunch, pit line lunch downstairs, so I think it was a good start at the end of this uh, session. Um, we are going to have six speakers uh, this afternoon. Can I have the slides, please? Um, the title is something to do with competing land use, it's competing objectives. So uh, if pit lands are converted, there will be a problem, there will be an opportunity, and uh, it is going to be um, Emanuela was telling us about the fire raging back in 2015 in central Kalimantan. It was October 2015. Right after that, the President of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, went to Paris and announced that Indonesia is going to fight fire and restore the land in December 2015. And then the Peace Restoration Agency was formed a month later. And that was January 2016. Then uh, the story continues. Indonesia is very eager to have uh, coordinating work with countries uh, across the globe, uh, dealing with Italy, working with Peru, with uh, Republic of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the International Pit uh, Center was formed. And we are going to hear uh, from the speakers uh, today, uh, one is from the government going to tell us about what the ITBC is all about. Can I have all of you uh, sitting in the uh, stage here, please? Dr. Agus Yusdianto. And then we also have uh, scientists working on pitlands. Uh, Chris Lell will be telling us about the story in, in uh, Peru, uh, how competing it is in terms of food production and also the uh, pastoral system. We will also hear from Rome, uh, in Skype, directly from Rome. Um, we will have Maria. And uh, Tinan speaking to us this afternoon. And uh, we'll hear from private sector who is trying to also join in this uh, fight against fire, against emissions. Uh, a large scale of peatland has been restored and, and conserved in Rio province. Uh, Mr. Newman will be telling us about. A huge pit dome in Rio province, uh, twice the size of Singapore, which is next to it, uh, sitting on, on a very uh, deep pit, and private sector is interested to, to deal with it in terms of using climate strategy to reduce emission while uh, operating this land-based uh, business. And then we will also have BRG, um, the duty of BRG dealing with research and development. Uh, Dr. Harris Gunawan will, will tell us about rewetting of uh, peatland. It's a large scale project, 2 million hectares in the past. Uh, since the BRG was formed in 2016, uh, we will hear how successful and what would be the challenge uh, in restoring peatland by rewetting them. Lastly, but not the least, uh, we will be hearing from Hokkaido University. Uh, Professor uh, Osaki will be telling us about the new uh, uh, methodology to be implemented in, in measuring or estimating emission. It is using the so-called tier three, the, the, the highest, the, the most accurate one, in order to estimate your emission. If restoration is conducted, if rewetting is implemented, what would be the emission? You need that kind of numbers to measure exactly what's happening. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Agus to tell us about what ITPC is all about. Thank you, Professor Kamen. Distinguished uh, moderator speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. On behalf of the International Tropical Pitan Center, NC4, in collaboration with Kyoto University, I would like to welcome you 
all in joining this peatland session at the Global Landscape Forum titled Climate Strategy and Peatlands Conservation, Managing Computing Demands from Food, Energy and the Environment. The objective of this session are to share uh, new knowledge and experiences around the implementation of peatland conservation and restoration, to discuss the progress and challenges of activities for restoration on the degraded peatlands, advancement of science and innovations in assessing peatlands greenhouse gases emissions, peat hydrology, fire risk and provision of ecosystem services. This would like to be achieved by engaging uh, multiple stakeholders including the government, international organization, private sector, research institution, university as well as local community. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. The United Nations Environmental Assembly or UNEA had its fourth session of recently in Nairobi on 11 to 15 March 2019 adopted a resolution among five resolutions proposed by Indonesia and supported by other member states and relevant stakeholders entitled Conservation and Sustainable Management of Peatlands. The resolutions, among others, use uh, member states and other stakeholders to provide greater emphasis to the conservation, sustainable management and restoration of peatland worldwide in support of the sustainable practice of the peatland management. To follow up on the implementation of the peatland resolution, it is important to build capacity, identify, synergize and related collaborative actions in managing peatland ecosystems in sustainable manner and safeguarding peatland ecosystem services that evolve from the interest of relevant international organizations, member states and other stakeholders. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, as we know, peatlands are the key ecosystem that play important roles in maintaining biodiversity, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, providing socio-economic livelihoods for ecosystem-dependent communities, and protecting inland from natural disasters. This ecosystem demonstrates their effectiveness in carbon storage and sea and the high potential for mitigating climate change when sustainably managed and protected. Despite of the importance of peatlands, they are among the most vulnerable ecosystems that could be threatened by anthropogenic activities. Currently, peatlands are under the combined pressures of an advancing agriculture frontier, oil palm, rubber and plantation and aquaculture, extractive economic activities, gas, petrol and logging, climate change, more hurricanes and drought and evapotranspiration, growing human populations, infrastructure development and pollution. A major threat to peatlands degradation is draining the peat that will affect ecosystem quality including biodiversity loss and increase the greenhouse gas emissions. Clearing and draining of peatlands over recent decades has resulted in an unprecedented increase in peat fires, which not only produce haze and pollution, but also endangers the multitude of critical ecological services, which has consequences for human livelihoods, health and well. As such, peatlands have gained significant attention among the member states, international organizations and other stakeholders that aim to maintain their ecosystem services and to avoid further destruction. Combining effort and utilizing synergies among stakeholders to safeguard peatlands and mangroves will lead to better results. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, in recognizing the importance of peatlands at global, regional and national in addressing climate change, protecting biodiversity, environment and contributing to the social economic welfare of people, Government of Indonesia with the governments of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Republic of Congo have established the International Tropical Peatland Center, which is built on the principle of true cross-sector collaboration and integration, building a resilient and holistic platform for science, policy and practice, 
and attracting the best minds working on research and practice in this field. ITPC will serve as goal to space for short short cooperation, supporting the dissemination of strategies and practices for tropical peatland management through coordinating and supporting collaborative international relationships and connecting different stakeholders, conduct and disseminate scientific research on tropical peatland management for sustainable development, become a center of excellence for tropical peatland research to support policy development and provide capacity building and technical services. The establishment of ITPC was the next step after the historic 2018 Brazzaville Declaration signed on 22nd March 2018 by the three governments to promote better management and conservation of the world's largest tropical peatlands, the Kufet Central Region in the Congo Basin, and to undertake other peatland initiatives. One of the mission of the ITPC is bringing government, researchers, practitioners, civil society, and other stakeholders together to ensure the conservation and sustainable management of tropical peatland. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I wish this session will provide a better understanding of synergies that derive from coordinated actions on peatlands among stakeholders, identify major gaps and limitations for safeguarding peatlands, and identify suitable policies and action for implementing, for conserving, sustainably managing and restoring peatlands that involve a multitude of actors. Last but not least, I would like to invite other countries, particularly with peatlands, international organizations, private sectors, universities, research institutions, and all other relevant actors to contribute and join to the ITBC. Thank you for your time and kind attention. Thank you, Fagus. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Christel Aribolaj. She's been working in Indonesia and Peru recently. Um, we've been talking about carbon dioxide, CO2, but uh, Christel is working on other gases which are also equally uh, detrimental to the climate, uh, especially when agriculture is introduced. Christel. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction and for the invitation to this session. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, in the natural state, peatlands are flooded during most of the year, and so they are under anaerobic conditions that slow down the decomposition of the organic matter. As a, as a result, most peat soils are uh, sinks of carbon dioxide, but there are also large sources of methane and small sources of nitrous oxide. By sequestrating carbon dioxide, a land that accumulates peat rapidly can build up about 10 centimeters of peat in about 100 years. Human intervention for agriculture or forestry modifies the balance of these greenhouse gases and often results in significant increases in carbon dioxide emissions and uh, changes in methane and nitrous oxide fluxes that will depend upon the activities um, and the practices that are implemented. Fire is the cheapest method for land clearing and also temporarily improves soil fertility and controls pests and weeds. Nonetheless, uh, land clearing by fire, as commonly practiced in Indonesia, is extremely harmful to the climate by releasing large amounts of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Um, one single fire burns about 10 centimeters of peat, that is uh, 100 years of accumulated peat. Moreover, uh, um, small-scale fires for land clearing can develop into uncontrolled uh, large-scale and widespread fires. Fires are detrimental to the environment uh, and also present uh, critical uh, public health and economic risks. Therefore, fire-free futures are imperative and require uh, engaging all fire actors and enabling uh, mediation 
question of diverse priorities um, informing uh, public education campaigns and shaping policies. Drainage of pit soils to allow crops or trees to be grown or to uh, facilitate access of livestock also uh, promotes a gradual decomposition of the pit and releases high amounts of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide uh, to the atmosphere. Drainage also promotes, promotes decreased methane emissions, which however never offset the simultaneous um, increase in carbon dioxide emissions. In general, uh, total greenhouse gases emissions are going to be higher as drainage deepens. <clears throat> Therefore, raising the water level in uh, crop lands and forest lands may uh, decrease the rate of greenhouse gases emissions, but this measure is only going to delay the process of peat decomposition. On the other hand, uh, raising the water table um, may constitute an effective measure to reduce fire risk. So, with regards to develop the new models of pit management, um, for instance, through replacement of DP drain croplands by shallow drain croplands, it must be noted that shallow drain croplands do not systematically emit, emit low levels of greenhouse gases. For instance, uh, rice cultivation on peat is conducted under shallow drainage but it needs uh, higher amounts of uh, carbon dioxide and methane. Um, furthermore, fertilization of croplands and pastures or plantation of nitrogen fixing species such as acacia also prompts uh, peat decomposition and exacerbates the emissions of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. Therefore, new models of peat management should avoid uh, those options that require high fertilization rates. Land use change without drainage can also um, increase greenhouse gases emissions. Let me mention the case of an area we, we've been working um, in uh, Tajun Putin National Park in central Kalimantan. This area had been slashed and burned for agroforestry by local communities before Tajun Putin became a national park. Um, afterwards, the area was uh, left to regenerate naturally. And when we conducted our research, the area had regrown into a 30-year-old secondary forest, but its greenhouse gas footprint was still 10 times uh, the footprint of the nearby primary forest. Unconverted peatlands that are overgrazed or overexploited for their natural resources uh, can also be a, a source of greenhouse gases. For instance, in the Peruvian Amazon, the prevailing peatland ecosystem is a swamp forest dominated by Mauritia flexuosa palms, which has been under human threat over decades due uh, to the high demand for the Mauritia flexuosa fruit which is often collected by cutting down at the entire pile. So this translates into significant uh, decreases in organic matter inputs and turns the pit into a large source of carbon dioxide. Let me finish uh, this talk but by underlining that um, despite the global significance of greenhouse gases emissions from tropical peatlands, the uncertainty associated with the estimates remain large and much more science is still needed uh, for decision-making regarding, for instance, the implementation of alternatives that are expected to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christelle. So the message here is it won't be a bit land if it is straight. So peatland should be wet, and we, can we do anything on the wet land? Uh, the next speaker is exactly going to tell us what paludi culture is, which is agriculture in, in the water, more or less. Uh, can we have Maria uh, online, please? Uh, she is going to be connected through Skype or whatever technology we have. Uh, Maria is uh, 
based in Rome with FAO, uh, part of the National Forest uh, Monitoring uh, Team, and also Red Plus. She's also been working a lot in, in various places that uh, Bagus mentioned in, in Congo, in Peru, in Indonesia. And uh, we would like to hear uh, her story about polluting culture, producing biomass, and other things that benefits the community. Maria, are you there? Hello, hello Daniel, hello everybody. Um, I can hear you very well and I can see you as well. Very tiny, but still. Uh, happy to talk today about the wet uh, production systems briefly. Um, let me just uh, check the timing. Um, so I would really start and highlight the, the word wet because, as Daniel said, the peatlands uh, should remain wet. And if we need to um, produce some. Uh, some uh, um, livelihood options from peatlands, in, in particular restored peatlands. So let's take uh, take the, the drain peatlands, which are often used for agriculture, forest drainage based uh, uh, agriculture products. Um, in this case, polyculture products need to be uh, wet. So this means blocking the drainage ditches and raising the water table close to the 30 centimeters uh, sweet spot where where the greenhouse gas emissions are, in most cases, optimized. Uh, the second key word after wet is the sustainable livelihoods. Um, that this means sustainable in the sense of three, three uh, pillars of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social sustainability. So in terms of environmental sustainability, uh, the polyculture systems using the wetland species can increase and bring back the biodiversity which has been hosted in those peatlands. At the same time, it is possible to reduce, at least stop, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, after several years of the revetting and, uh, and maintain the peat body, avoiding the land loss and subsidence and also fires as Christian brought up. Um, and of course, here we need to think about the long-term option. A lot of the drainage-based uh, management of peatlands is really a short-term uh, option, and in these uh, times of uh, rapid climatic changes, we really need something that we can plan and build systems for longer-term utilization. Polyculture is also innovative. Um, there is an investment that it has been done in the past 15, 20 years to develop different kinds of more industrial scale uh, polyculture, but in particular for smallholders. Um, and then fourth uh, keyword I would say is challenge. As Crystal pointed out, we still need to evaluate, uh, first of all, um, in, um, apply for larger scale different polyculture practices which have been developed, especially in temperate zones, but now we need to move on much more quicker also in the tropical zones. Um, the policy harmonization was brought, uh, brought up already by Bagaus Justianto, but this is something where we really need to look into so that the polyculture products such as rattan or Sagu don't face uh, unnecessary um, policy hurdles or uh, prohibitions. Um, in, in, um, in addition to that, there is a need for developing machinery, there is a need to develop value chains, but we can go more into detail with, about this in the discussion part. And the last key word I would say is the chance. It's a chance for us to develop quickly now sustainable livelihood options from the over thousand species that have been identified in the different uh, climatic zones to be fitted for polyculture. Um, so that was my definition of what polyculture is. And the second question we I had from uh, Daniel to answer is, why is it so important for peat and ecosystem in terms of food production? So not all the species naturally uh, that can be used for polyculture are suitable for food production. However, one um, important area that maybe has been a lot over in the past years is that in when the uh, peatland ditches are being blocked. Uh, there is a possibility and already existing practices, for example in Indonesia, to produce fish in a sustainable manner. It's a low intensity fish production, 
uh, but still it can produce important nutritional values for the local communities. Um, the same applies, by the way, in Congo, where their fish has a very high, uh, high value and it can be a very important income option. The second group of uh, food products that can be derived from uh, wet peatlands are, for example, fruits, berries, nuts. Um, then I already mentioned the sagu palm, uh, which can uh, provide a stable food and kind of a pasta, which is very tasty. Thank you for Indonesian host for, uh, host for uh, making me taste that. Um, in addition, there can be also some very like small-scale livestock production. For example, uh, honeybees uh, can be very, very well bred in, in uh, peatlands, even if there is a flowering plant in the south. Also, feed uh, fodder can be grown in, in uh, wet conditions and harvested in uh, low intrusive, intrusive um, means and machinery. Um, in addition, I would like to bring up two, two points in addition to these examples of uh, food products. The water security is part of food security and the uh, using of a very uh, water hungry um, plantation species uh, on drain peatlands is actually have been very detrimental to the many, many landscapes for the water flow and water, also flood control in many uh, peatland areas. Therefore, the water quality and uh, water maintaining the natural water flow in the landscapes is an important factor and should be ignored as part of the food security aspects. We already talked briefly about nutrition, and but for all of these different uh, species, it is important and different food products. It is important to develop very uh, solid value chains so that the smallholders, for example, would invest in the development of these kind of food products, not only for their family but maybe also for uh, for being sell, um, sold even to the international market. It is important that that we have solid livelihood options. That, uh, that was about the food systems and food uh, food production. Uh, if I still have time, I'm, uh, I fact that I don't hesitate to tell me, but there is also oh, the know. question. Uh, okay, I already <laughs> used it. Sorry, but then I need to talk about Okay, but you can stay tuned and uh, people might come back to you. Okay? Yes. So please bear with us. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. So it's another component of wetland with productive system. So we don't jeopardize the livelihood when the land are regretted or flooded. Uh, the next speaker is from private sector. Uh, Mr. Nyoman uh, Yugaswara is going to tell us about how private sector is also concerned about conserving and restoring peatland. Um, as I said, uh, RER is twice the size of Singapore and it's huge peat dome in, in Rio province, Indonesia. Thank you, Pa. Daniel. Uh, First, let me start by thanking uh, the International Tropical Peatland Center, uh, and colleagues, uh, and C4 for hosting uh, this session this afternoon, who letting uh, representative of private sector speak of what's going on on the ground in terms of uh, restorations. Uh, but Daniel just makes briefly, uh, Aria Restoration Western Ria uh, is lying in the eastern coast of Sumatra Island. Uh, the total area that we are managing for ecosystem restoration is 150,000 hectares. It's uh, more than the double size of London. Uh, also more than the uh, uh, size of, of uh, double Singapore, what size of London, in fact. Um, we are operating under the uh, ecosystem restoration license. Uh, so the ultimate objective uh, said and task uh, to us who manage the land is to bring back the uh, ecological balance in, in the regions. We are operating all on the peatland, and as part Daniel uh, briefly mentioned, it's uh, having uh, the, the big dog with it. Uh, so we are now managing uh, the, uh, the area which previously, uh, two decades ago, were issued as the uh, concession license. So the nature of the area is uh, production forest on state forest. Uh, so it still has uh, the production uh, status, but it's licensed as the ecosystem restorations uh, op 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 operations. 
What we are doing on the ground, uh, similarly, if Professor Mishino earlier mentioned the BRG approach with the three R plus one R uh, as suggested, uh, we have uh, the approach what we call is PARM, P A R M. Uh, first is to, to protect. It is important for us now to uh, maintain the area as it is because more than 70 percent of the forest cover in the area we are managing is still in the medium to good uh, forest cover with natural with native species of natural forest on the big land of, of Riau. And to add, uh, this is in fact by size, is one of the largest intact big uh, land forests that remaining in, in Sumatra. Secondly, uh, because this was a uh, consistent forest, we have inherited with more than 100 kilometers of old canals. It's of course as big land we have to cross the canals. So mainly our resolution work is defined into the uh, crossing all the inherited canals that we have. Uh, but from time to time we also have to uh, assist the nature for its natural regenerations for the area that are identified and included in our annual plan as, as proved by the government of Indonesia uh, to restore it more than 55 uh, native species uh, from uh, its own land. And of course we cannot detach from the people, from the community. Uh, they are no community to live within, uh, as I mentioned, because this was a, concept, uh, a local concession uh, two decades ago. But we are working with the community that live around the area to ensure, to manage, as well as the competing interest, competing demand for them to use the forest still, uh, not only the part of the forest, but also the river that are going into the, the forest. So by then, uh, we are trying to uh, look at how to manage this as a holistic landscape approach. In a unique way, uh, as uh, I come from other sectors, Restoration uh, uh, or RER is adopting the production and protection model where one supports to another in its sense. Uh, RER uh, in Riau is surrounded by a range of fiber plantation that works not only as a protection buffer but also providing the operational financial support for RER to operate in the long term. For your information, for each license issued for ecosystem restorations by the government of Indonesia, we have uh, a minimum 60 years uh, operations uh, to complete uh, due to the uh, ultimate objective to bring the ecological uh, balance uh, back. ARIA was initiated back in 2013 uh, by every group and so far uh, we have made progress. Restoration is happening on the ground. Uh, firstly, I say we cannot work without the support of people, the support of the community on the ground. And we have had this from 2015. I think my sisters from uh, uh, Kalimantan mentioned in 2015 how bad it was uh, Sumatra and Kalimantan. But the fact in 2015 to 2018, restoration is free from fire. And that's not only because we try to protect, but we work with the local people to understand and to avoid any burning parties happening on the ground. Secondly, through assessment, we have uh, made the biodiversity failing, the biodiversity uh, assessment. So far, in the past five years, we have uh, managed to identify 759 species that exist uh, in the ecosystem area. Not to mention many of those species are IUCN globally protected, is, are listed in the ICN database, and uh, many of them are critically endangered status. Six out of nine hornbill are exist in the associated system we have. And if you refer to the BirdLife International Assessments, that compound landscape was so part of the important bird areas. And once they did an assessment only back in 1991 to 1992, they only managed to record 128 species. But by now, Aliyah has been able to record it at least 304 bird species compared back to 1991 to 1992. And of course, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that we have managed to close 38% of total length of the canal that we have 
in Ariane that's equal to over 65 kilometers of all canals that begin uh, Ariane. Lastly, uh, I'm pleased that Amy mentions in the closing of uh, the morning session, uh, by Daniel, uh, it's always a challenge for us from private sectors to tell about progress on the ground, that something is good. But this is one of the models for all of us to motivate all of us that restoration is possible with the right models, with uh, supporting and enabling policy from the government as well as from the corporate will, who has uh, contributions uh, to support the restoration uh, happening. If today you hear from me, you listen from me, I hope one day you will see it by yourself on the ground. Uh, if any of you would like to come to IR, uh, we have also received uh, quite numbers of list proposals to do on the ground. We are currently trying to provide a, a decent uh, this is a facility, so if you come to the research in Aria, uh, you can stay with us in, in, in quite this way. The time will come, uh, information is coming to you uh, uh, to see and experience what we are doing on the ground. But I hope uh, what, I, what I'm telling you today uh, uh, can be inspiring that the restoration uh, ecosystem is happening. The restoration of the land uh, can do with all the elements that, that we are having. Uh, I don't believe we will have uh, enough time for questions, but uh, I will be staying. Uh, the whole afternoon today, so please approach me and I have a recent report as well for you three if you are interested. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Thank you. So, uh, rocking the canal uh, in RER is quite a success. Uh, we will be hearing what the government is planning for these two million hectares of pitman when they are trying to restore by re wet them, and it has to be done carefully through the hydrological system. Uh, Harris will be telling us, as a deputy of the BRG, uh, he is playing a dual role as practitioner as well as scientist, uh, because he's uh, responsible for research and development. Thank you, uh, Pak Daniel. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, konnichiwa. Uh, before I give the presentation, uh, I just get the good inspiration from the Iman one. Thank you, Iman one. My feeling like, huh, we was born on the pitland area. Almost 17 years, we feel has disaster. But I think the our Fed or our feeling or our experience quite different because I am also graduate from Kyoto University. Thank you for organizing committee to invite me come back here. But I am also say that this is not very good for the uh, session because most of Muslim still fasting. In Indonesia, 12 hours, but here we have to fasting 17 hours. But it's okay, we are Gambati. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbani. And we would like to also, uh, this opportunity, I want to uh, give mention, very strong message the Indonesia government. Just only one the country in the world. President Jokowi make the policy for the Big Land Restoration Agency to make how to restore around the 2 million hectare area. So let's see what Pak Daniel mentioned about what the real situation on the uh, achievement of restoration. So we say that not only railway thing but also the other activities should be done in integrity. Allow me to just uh, read my speech. Indonesia has restored pitland in fragmented pitland hydrocarbon unit. Total number of the pitland hydrocarbon unit is around uh, 37865. 
after to decades or more, peatland management in Indonesia has been transformed approach from cutting into piece of the landscape management to management of pit hydrogel unit. Pit hydrogel unit are pit ecosystem bordering with two river, river and the sea, or in swamp area, or in the my latest field visit to the island that we also found the pit line hydrology unit in the small small island, especially in the Rio province, bordering with the smart Singapore and the Malaysia country. Why hydrological units is important? Because a main role hydrological properties is in sustaining pit ecosystem because it land is consist eighty percent water. <coughs> the story, very sad story about the central Kalimantan that the before in the last two twenty years ago, the government opened the pit land two million hectare for the rice field, but also not successful. Moreover, the NETS has changed the behavior of pit hydrology unit which flow the water from dome to several lower directions and then entering catchment area. Due to drainage, water flow could be totally different depending on where and how the drainage were established. Consequently, pit restoration is important to be started with, restor with restoring hydrological pitland unit. Also, in the true sense of restoration, it is impossible to restore to its original state. Nevertheless, it is efforted to increase water table based on function zone that the Indonesia government already established the regulation. Pit restoration has been conducted since 2016, comprising the planning, implementation, education, participation, and research and development. As an ad hoc institution, all four elements work contingency. Research and development has effort to facilitate research through partnership with the university and other uh, institutions. So, example in Rio, we have a very good commodity as like a sagu, sagu palm. We can show that very good grow the sagu on the white pit line. In the center of Kalimantan, we also develop the fish, local fish. They can also as the local livelihood alternative. So the my conclusion, <coughs> pit hydrogel units are integrated landscape of pit ecosystem. Degradation in one part has impact in the other part. BRJ has conducted pit restoration by approaching pit and hydrogel unit. However, challenge to fire mitigation remain at the integrating socio economic and ecology. I think that's all my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Harris. So, pit hydrological unit is part of the planning uh, tool uh, in order to restore the degraded and drained pitland. And that has a lot to do with the emission. Uh, our next speaker is going to tell us how the emission factor and activity data that are needed to calculate emission should be improved from time to time. So Dr. Osaki will be telling us about tier 3 emission of Pitland and that will be the, the highest possible numbers that we can use for accuracy. Thank you, Daniel. So the, myself and the Hokkaido University, the team, and uh, have a long time to study the, the peatland in Indonesia and uh, collaborate with uh, many 
Institute of Indonesia. Then, so we are the focusing the, all the parameters of the, the b the monitoring. And so, and we are concluding the water is uh, the most important element. And uh, you know the pit, the, the, the carbon sequestration also is very important. And so, the many the result and so today the, I focus on the how to say how to evaluation or how to modeling of the, the carbon the emission, CO2 uh, emission uh, related to the waters. And so the <coughs> Daniel asked me to the, the three step for explanation why is the, the ground monitoring system and how to match this data to the satellite data and how to make a model and uh, finally to how to use or how to extend it, uh, these models. So the first, uh, the, I try to explain, uh, we call the SESAME the system. This is a sensory data transmission the service system. And so the, on the ground, so the, we the, collecting several the, the data using the several sensors and water quality, ECPH or ORP or so on, and soil moisture, ground surface the elevation and substance, and dendrometer for the evaluation diameter of the track, which, which is related to the, the plant growth, and the total weather the systems. So we call the, this is the sesame. Uh, so this, uh, what they say, the, the consists of the, 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 what they say, the using the internet systems and we collect the data uh, in the server and uh, so we can access the, the, the data on the PC and we can uh, make a model. Uh, so real time the data we can get the, uh, in our laboratory or somewhere in, in the world. So this is uh, the Sesame system and already we operated to more than the 10 years and huge the, the data we are collecting. Then so the, you see the, uh, also we the, apply the, the AD covariance the methodology to evaluate the, the carbon the dioxide. Then so also this data more than 20 years we are operating in, in the pit run. So the, we have a lot of data in the point data and so how to extend this data, so we try to, to apply the satellite data. So the, then so we, I explain now the carbon accounting system, the monitoring data and how to find the sensing data. And so <coughs> the, we do for evaluation the carbon the emissions, so the key the parameter is uh, the voters. And so uh, using the sesame data, and so we found the soil moisture on the surface and the groundwater table. They have uh, the, the linear correlations. Then so we are looking at the, the, the soil the moisture data from the satellite. And so one or two the satellite data is available. The, this is uh, the, what you say, the, uh, NCEP, the National Center for Environment Prediction, uh, released uh, from the NOAA and uh, USA. Uh, so this is a free and uh, every day uh, we can uh, get uh, this uh, download. So this is a global scale uh, land surface moisture. And uh, so uh, at first we decide to use these data. And so, but uh, unfortunately, the, this the soil moisture the, is uh, 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. And so, the, this grid too large, and so the, we are worrying about to apply that our model. But now, so, uh, JAXA, the, the satellite, uh, we call the tail band, the sensitive capillaries radar, the PARSA, is uh, uh, 15 meters, 15 meters. Then so the, we can now so the, uh, the improve
improving the, just the global data into more the details. And so now we can get a 15 meter, 15 meter resolution the water tables. And so <coughs> the whole our studies uh, we are monitoring the CO2 emission uh, by using the the, the AD covariance, the tower, the, and so we can get the NEE, the net ecosystem exchange, which means the, the total balance in the forestry or the peatland, the, including photosynthesis, the respiration, and the peat degradations. And so we found uh, this NEE have a negative correlation with uh, water tables. Then so now you know the already the water table mapping, and so we put the coefficient of this division, and so now we success to get the CO2 emission the map or models in the PITRAM. And so, so the, also we are developing the another models, the CO2 emission by estimation the peat subsidence, not gas. And so peat substance. Also, we developing the something the laser the distance models. And so the, this the substance. Also, we found the, have a, the relation with uh, the water tables. So again, the, in based on the water tables, so we can calculate for modeling and peat substance, and which give the peat substance map. And so this is related to uh, what I say, the peat degradation by microorganisms. So we have now two, two, two models. One is a gas exchange and another is a, the peat substance, which is related also to the CO2 emission. And so important point, the two, two models, the now so the cross-checking. So this is very important, applying the, the new models for evaluation, the carbon dioxide emissions. And also we are focusing the, the fire effect. So this is also a big the effect to CO2 emission. And so the fire also the, we found uh, related to the groundwater levels. And so decreasing the groundwater levels can make a fires and uh, uh, frequency and intensity is uh, very close related to this water table the levels and so also using this water table the, the models and the coefficient put into this the map and so we can the, now get uh, the fire frequency map and uh, the fire intensity map then so we also calculate the carbon dioxide emission uh, using this model. And so as you know, the, the, the carbon emission by fires, and so the peat degradated or lost, and so using the pulsar the interferometry, then so the directory to evaluation, the, we now success. And so in the case of the, the fires, also we have uh, two models to, to why is uh, the CO2 emission by fire the, using the, the water table model and another is a direct evaluation of the, the pulses. And so finally, so this system, uh, what they say, that we call the tier 3. Tier 3 is a big high level uh, the CO2 evaluation systems. And so now uh, we apply the or uh, try to to what they say, make an international standard. Then so the, this technology also available in Peru and Congo. And also we are now thinking this, this is not only the, the P-Tram, and wet also we can cover the, this model, including the mango. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Osaki. So I think we cover a lot of ground from this story of drain pitland and it is going to be really wet. It's only associated with reducing emission, associated with avoiding subsidence and fires, but also the, the technology, the result is going to be extrapolated to 
many other places. So it's, it's quite promising in terms of science development. So uh, from point, data point to, to spatially explicit, that's a very useful tool uh, in the future. And uh, we just heard uh, this week the IPCC uh, 2019 refine uh, is going to be released very soon and uh, wetland including peatland is also been separated from the land use uh, sector. So you have 2013 supplement of the IPCC uh, guideline. So I think peatland has uh, been receiving a lot of attention. I think we uh, can move forward in terms of improving the livelihood, improving our environment.